Good afternoon from Dublin, Ireland, uh, or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are around the world. And um, we're going to kick off the MongoDB webinar four in the Back to Basics series, where we'll talk about geospatial and full text indexing. Before we start, I just want to draw your attention to an event that we'll be running uh, on November the 15th in London, our first European-wide MongoDB conference. Um, this is a fantastic place to come and learn more about MongoDB. We'll have lots of the senior executives from MongoDB, including our CTO, talking about what's, for the, what's in future for MongoDB and what we're working on currently. It's a one-day event. You can sign up today using my uh, subscription code JD20, and you'll get 20% off your tickets. Uh, I do recommend if you can get to London in November, this will be a great event. Um, so do sign up. <clears throat> so back to basics webinar four. Well done to everybody who's managed to keep up through all the last four, three uh, webinar series. We're going to talk today about advanced indexing, specifically two kinds of indexes that are very specific to MongoDB, text and geospatial indexes. My name is Joe Drumgoul, and I'm Director of Developer, Deve Developer Advocacy at uh, MongoDB, covering the EMEA region. Um, I'm on Twitter as jdrumgoul. Um, you can ask questions during the session. We'll try and answer them online, or I'll cover them at the end. Um, we have a Back to Basics email address, which uh, my buddy Sam will post to the chat area. <clears throat> and you can email us there if you have questions about the talk afterwards. So what we've covered up to date, uh, in webinar one, we talked about introduction to NoSQL and the different types of NoSQL databases, graph, wide column, key value store. And then we talked about document databases. That's MongoDB. Right? It's designed to be a general purpose database built around a document model, where documents are JSON documents. Then in webinar two, we built your first application. Uh, we showed you how to create databases and collections. Collections are what we call tables. We showed you the basic CRUD operations. Um, we showed you how to add indexes. And also, we showed you how to use explain plans and explain analysis to make sure you're using the indexes and using the indexes efficiently. Then the last webinar was about schema design, about how to think in documents. How do we wonder about our schema or the use of schema in a dynamically schema database? And we showed you various embedding approaches, so from full embedding to partial embedding to no embedding, and gave you some examples. So today, we're going to talk about indexing. So indexing, if you recall from our previous webinars, is just an efficient way to look up data by its value. If we didn't have indexes, it's just like reading a book. If I threw a book down in front of you, um, War and Peace, for instance, and I said, find all references to the name Ivanovich in War and Peace, well, without an index, you've got to read the whole book. And I've read War and Peace. It takes about three weeks, and it's hard going for the first couple of chapters. So you don't really want to read the whole book. And what we do to ensure that we don't do table scans, effectively reading the whole book or looking at every item of data in the database, is we build an index. And an index in a database, uh, from, a, from a functional perspective, operates exactly like an index in a book. It's a fast lookup by essentially doing a, an inverted lookup of a set of named keys. So for War and Peace, you might have all the characters in the book and where they're referenced. And then you could very quickly go to the back of the book and say, here's where Ivanovich is referenced. In traditional databases, we use B trees for this structure. And a B tree is a form of tree. I'm not going to teach people how to do trees here. But a B tree is a very specific kind of tree. We're all familiar with binary trees that effectively have a divider at each node. Well, a B tree attempts to make binary trees more efficient by putting several nodes in each node of the tree, or several values in each node of the tree. And for each value, the node that it points to contains only elements that are less than that value. So in this example here, <clears throat> 7 points to values 
before 7, the null between 7 and 16 points to values between those values and 16 points to values over the value 16. What this does is effectively reduces the depth of the tree. And that's, a, that's an important factor if you're going to be hitting the disk, because each disk access is very, very inefficient. So if you, if you were using a simple binary tree, the depth of the tree can get quite large, and each, each reference to a, a piece of the tree can be expensive. So with a B tree, um, queries, inserts, and deletes are essentially big O notation about log n time, which is actually just a function of the depth of the tree. So essentially, <clears throat> your references can at worst case be this, the, the depth of the tree. You may do better in some cases. B trees are used in every relational database in the world today and in MongoDB. Um, one of the things you discover when you talk about MongoDB is underneath the covers, it's really, there's a lot of concepts that you'll find in relational. And B trees are great for text, for numbers, for strings, for monetary values, for dates. Very efficient, right? And, and they're easy to create. We talked about this before. So database name, DB, dot collection name, C-O-L-L, that could be my posts or my data or whatever, then create index, and then we talk about a field name that we're going to index on, and then a direction, and a direction essentially tells you whether you're building an, an ascending or a descending index. That is kind of irrelevant because once you create an index, you can essentially query it on ascending or descending order, and the, the B3 allows you to do that very efficiently. And you can create nested fields and compound indexes um, and there's plenty of documentation on the docs.mongodb.com website on how to use uh, the indexes for simple indexes. But <clears throat> there are two other kinds of indexes that MongoDB supports. Um, and these extend the use cases and the capabilities of the database into areas that we traditionally haven't seen in databases like MySQL or in key value stores like Couchbase or in uh, uh, wide column stores like Cassandra. <clears throat> the first one is full text index. A full text index allows you to search inside the text of a document. So imagine I have, thinking back to our blogging application, imagine I have a comment field. The comment field has a, an author, a timestamp, and a string, which is the comment. Now, I can do very efficient indexing on the, on the username who posted the comment. I can do very efficient indexing on the timestamp. But if I want to index the comments, I can't really index them because the, the, every comment value is different. This is what we mean by unstructured data. The value side of that is essentially random. It's based on what people type in. If you want to search into that key, um, then what we need to be able to do is create what we call a full text index, which essentially breaks up the value into the component words and indexes those words. It's what's called an inverted index or a text index. There's plenty of documentation on inverted indexes on Wikipedia. I'm not going to go into the detail of exactly how these things are implemented. The ones you'll have heard of are Lucene, Solar, and Elasticsearch. These are dedicated full text indexing machines. They allow you to t index text and text inside files. They don't give you quite the capabilities and the query ability of MongoDB, but they do give you text indexing. So in 2.4, we added full text indexing to MongoDB because for a lot of our customers, they wanted to reduce the complexity of their environments, and by not having to run a separate set of servers to do full text indexing, it made their deployment simpler. We also added, uh, quite a while ago, geospatial indexes. And geospatial indexes are different. Again, a geospatial index answers the question, what's the geography around me? How near are things to me? Am I inside a bounding box or a circle of a particular location? Can you find me in a particular location? Me, and, and so essentially, we'll, it, it answers the question that Facebook answers when you check in, it tells you sometimes about friends near you. If you're familiar with um, with um, oh, the Foursquare website, 
Foursquare provides the same capability when you check in, it tells you about things near you. Foursquare is built on top of MongoDB and uses the geospatial index so that essentially it says, when I check into a location, who is near me, who is within 50 yards, 100 yards, 200 yards. <coughs> Neither of these index types use B-trees. We need to use different kinds of indexes for them. I'm not going to go into the detail of how these are implemented. There's plenty of documentation. Um, but absolutely, uh, there is lots of online information on how to use these, how these things are built. So give you an example of a full text index. So an inverted index with all the words inside a single field created. So you can only create one text index per collection, but you can index any and all of the fields with that text index. So effectively, you could say, I'm going to index on every single field. So I want all the text in every field indexed completely. Now, full text indexes can grow large. So my advice is create the full text indexes where you think they'll have most power or most relevance. So in the event of a blogging application, we obviously want to index the comments, at least, and probably the posts. So if we've got a post database, I'll do db.post.createIndex, comments. And now I use a special denom denominator, text, which effectively tells the indexing engine to create a text index on this field. And then I can do, if you look at the comment field up top here, you can see there's an info field here. There's a little string info. So I can say db.posts.find dollar text, which tells me I'm using the text index, right? So I don't have a key here because I may be indexing more than one field. Dollar search because I may add other search parameters in the future. And then I'm looking for the word info. And sure enough, info is in this comment. So it comes up ID. I've, I've, I've kind of ellipsed uh, or managed out the object ID. And you get the comment string, right? So this is finding this document based on one of the strings inside the value. And so if I, once I've created the index, I can do db.posts.getIndexes. And what you'll see is we have a name here, comment.txt. That's relevant. We have weights, which I'm going to talk about. So we can relatively weight the different text fields that we index in order to give some more prominence. We've got a language. So we can specify the language in which this index is created. So imagine you had a blog in which comments and all of the posts were in Spanish. Well, then you would set the language to Spanish because there's a stemming rule that effectively uses the word roots to find words and derivatives of them. And then there's a text index version, which is three. We're only going to talk about three. There are older versions of the text indexing engine and older versions of MongoDB. And of course, this is a text index, so it nam names it there. And we drop text inches by name rather than shape. It turns out this is something even I discovered today. You can drop any index by name, but it's specifically used for text indexes. So if I want to drop this index, I'll use this string here, the, uh, the name string. So common text index here. So when I want to drop an index, I do db.posts.dropIndex. And it's common text tag. It's a slightly different name here because I was using a different example. And it will say index was two, OK, one. That's essentially saying the number of indexes has been decremented by one. And you can set the name for your index. And you can do this with all indexes, not just text indexes, to make this easier and more memorable. So I'm going to say name text index. And so when I create this index on comments and on the tags field, I get name text index as being the one that I drop. And on the server, what you'll see if you look on the server, and I do recommend when you're playing around with MongoDB, have a window open with the server running in a log. Don't pipe the log output to a file when you're learning MongoDB, because it's always interesting to see what the server is doing. <clears throat> when you look at the server, you can see these activities happening. So you can see text indexes being made. When you're creating large indexes, it will give you progress. When you see errors, when you see slow queries, Always worthwhile. So, so when I'm running MongoDB in my own laptop, I always have three windows open. I have the window, which effectively shows me 
the interactions I'm doing, whether I'm running an editor or the shell. I have the MongoDB server running and effectively streaming its log output to the window, and I have Mongo stat running, which essentially tells me the activity on the server right now, so I can see queries, I can see inserts. And that gives me immediate feedback when things I'm doing are working. So if I'm running a big job that's inserting and I'm not seeing inserts happening on Mongo stat, then I know to look and find out what the problem is. So let's do a more detailed example. So I'm going to insert some comments, and I'm going to use just color names. So I can say db.post.insert comment red, yellow, orange, green, then pink, purple, blue, and then red, pink. Now I can do db post dollar text dollar search red, and that's going to return two objects. So red, yellow, orange, green, and red, pink. And then I can do db.post.search red, green, and it's only going to return the first document and the second and the second document, right? Red, pink, and red, green. Because notice it's matching red and green in any document. So it returns red, pink, and red, yellow, orange, green. I'm also going to search lowercase red, and this is what we'll discover is by default, text searches are case insensitive. You can set a variable dollar case insensitive to be false, and that will force them to be case sensitive in terms of searching. So in that case, when I search for lowercase red, I wouldn't get any of these documents turning up. And we can assign weights, right? So I might decide, and this would probably be a sensible decision, on my blog, when I'm searching for a particular string, I'm going to weight tags higher than comments because tags are something I add to give metadata to a post. So I might add MongoDB or indexing or full text search as a tag. And then when somebody searches my blog, I'd prefer them to find tagged posts rather than posts in which full text indexing or MongoDB are mentioned. So now we can increase the weights. So comment is 5 and tags is 10. These are just relative weightings, so they'll give them more money, more, more, uh, more, more interest. And we're making a text index again here. And now we'll notice we're making a text index on two fields, comments and tags. So now we can do db.posts.find and search for red. And now we add a metadata value, score. This is part of the projection set. Uh, if you remember from our first or second webinar, we can always include a projection in any find to essentially tell us fields to add or remove. So this is a special kind of projection which says add a text score field. That's what the dollar meta is saying. And then I'm going to sort by this score field, right? So I can only sort by this score meta field if I add it as a projection. And now, when we search for red, well, guess what? We're going to find this one first because red appears in the tags, and we, pref we prefer that over the red appearing in comments. So now you'll see tags red, green, orange gets a score of 6.666 recurring. Red, pink in comments gets 3.75. And red, yellow, orange just gets a score of 3.125. So essentially, it gives you a ranking ability to, to give you the score. So if you're using a large text index on a very large number of comments, you can decide which ones to display when you do a search on them. And of course, essentially, this is what Google is doing behind the scenes when you type a search into Google. It ranks the results based on a score. The scoring mechanism in Google is a lot more complicated than this. But the principle is exactly the same. Other parameters, pick the language you want to search in. You can choose a language. There's a range of languages which are documented. We can turn on case sensitivity. We can also turn on diacritic sensitivity. That means we can search for properly accented words in the right order. So effectively, if you're searching for cafe with an accent and cafe with no accent, it will find them in the right order. Again, only relevant if you're going to be storing comments that allow diacritics in their words. So that's full text indexes. Now I'm going to talk about geospatial indexes. So MongoDB supports a range of legacy indexes, but the one that's most popular and the one I'm going to talk about today is 2D sphere indexes. 
is it allows a user to represent any location or, or a set of locations or indeed an area on the Earth. We've got to remember in this scenario that the, the Earth is a sphere. <clears throat> so when you look at a flat model of the Earth, it's mapped onto a, onto a model. And there's a projection used to make that mapping. The most popular, the one you'll see most often, is the Mercator projection. And if you look at it, it stretches all the countries in the northern and southern hemispheres. So they look larger than the countries near the equator. This is why Greenland looks about the same size as Africa, even though it's about a tenth of the size. The coordinates are stored in a standard called GeoJSON. This is an international standard. We can look it up again online. And we support a subset of GeoJSON operations. The implementation of our geospatial indexes is based on what's called a quad tree. I'm not going to try and explain it now, but if anybody wants to look that up, there's plenty of documentation online. And there's an international standard around all this is based, which is essentially the, uh, the GPS standard, which is WGS84. So once you start playing around with this stuff, you'll see that these, this means that a lot of the work that you do in MongoDB will look and play nicely with Google Maps. So coordinates are represented as a longitude and a latitude. And if you remember those lines on your maps, Longitude is the lines running from the North Pole to the South Pole, and they essentially measure degrees east and west of what's called a meridian. Now, the standard meridian is set at zero degrees in Greenwich in London and goes uh, east towards China and west towards America, and it counts up to 180 degrees, so effectively half the globe. Um, for locations west, we specify it as a negative, in MongoDB for locations east, we specify it as a positive. Um, latitude is the lines going across the map, the lateral lines, and they measure distances from the equator north and south. And they go 90 degrees to the north or minus 90 degrees to the south. <clears throat> now, one little gotcha, which throws people off when they start playing around with this, coordinates in MongoDB are stored in longitude, latitude order. That means the, the distance is east and west first, and the distance is north and south second. In Google, coordinates are stored and specified in latitude, longitude order. They're reversed. So you'll see that when I start playing around, that the reversal of the coordinates is something that catches out a lot of people. So remember, Google is lat long, MongoDB is long lat. Think mong long. MongoDB long is first. Right? There's three versions of the 2D Sphere Index. Version 1 was in MongoDB up to 2.4. Version 2 is from MongoDB 2.6 onwards. <coughs> Excuse me. And version 3 is from MongoDB 3.2 onwards. MongoDB 3.2 is the most relevant one. We're only going to be talking about version 3 in this webinar. And you should be downloading and playing with MongoDB 3.2. So creating a 2D Sphere Index is really simple. You see db.collection.createIndex. We use the same call for all of these indexes. And we just specify a field and then call it 2D sphere. So this is the denominator that tells you what kind of index it is. The location field must store GeoJSON data. If it doesn't, that index collection and creation will, will fail, and you'll get an error. And so what you've got to do then is fix it up. For a dynamically schema database, this can be a challenge with large data sets, particularly if one or two of the fields have been corrupted during data load. So important that you understand that that's one of the things that we offer a constraint on. And so what you'll get here is db.test.createIndex. Location is 2D sphere. And you'll get the standard number of indexes before one, number of indexes after two. And then on this, on, when you look at this index, what you'll see is it tells you it gives you a name, and it says it's a 2D sphere, and it gives you the version. And it's version 3 because we're running MongoDB 3.2. <clears throat> so this is how you tell what kind of indexes and types of indexes you have. So we're going to play around with a very simple data set just to give you some examples. We're going to search for restaurants in the Manhattan and metropolitan area. We're going to lose, use these two data collections, um, which I'm hoping that uh, Sam can grab out of the deck and post into the chat. 
Um, this will allow you to download them. They're also on the documentation for geospatial searching on the MongoDB docs page. So if you don't want to play around with them now with me, you can download them afterwards. We can import these into MongoDB using the MongoDB import tool, Mongo import. And this just says, I want to give the collection name neighborhoods, and I want to call the database geo, and it's importing neighborhoods.json, the file. And the same thing, collection restaurants, and database geo. <coughs> so doing a simple find just to show you what these things look like. Neighborhoods is essentially, it's got an object ID, and then it's got a geometry, and the coordinates are effectively a polygon, and it specifies a region. So the region Bedford is defined by this polygon. I've elided some of the points here. So let me show you Bedford on Google Maps just to show you what it looks like. Um, if I just go to my browser here, uh, Google Chrome, So if I type Bedford into MongoDB, Bedford, New York, you'll see there's the Bedford region. You see it's outlined in, right, in red here. And so there's a polygon defining that region. So that defines a neighborhood, okay? And then we've got a restaurant, and that's effectively just a point Right, so the location is just a coordinates, and it's two points, right? So 73.98 and 40.57954. Now, as before, uh, remember these coordinates are reversed, right? So when you type this into Google, you'll be typing in 40.57955 and 73.9 whatever, 918. So I can show this again, <coughs> just to give you an example. So it's 40.75 and 73.98. So I can just type this in. This is just one of the features of Google. I can do 40.57 and minus 73.98. And it will give you a point. I've got that slightly off there because it's out in the middle of the sea, so I didn't give it the highest resolution. But you can type any coordinate into uh, Google Maps and find that location. You can also, if you pick a, a location on the map, let's just get inland. So I can go uh, what's here, and it will tell you the geolocations underneath here. <coughs> So the, here's the location, and its name is Riviera Caterer. So we can add indexes to both of these collections. So db.restaurants that create index location 2D sphere, and db.neighborhoods that create index geometry. So location and geometry are the two fields. So notice that <coughs> with, with neighborhoods, these are actually polygons. And with restaurants, they're actually just point locations. And then we can use an operator called geointersects. This essentially tells you about points or locations that are either overlapping or adjacent to the object that we're looking for. So we can do db.neighborhoods that find one. Within the geometry field, I want to find something that intersects with this point here. So we're essentially saying, you know, is there a location inside this geometry? So we're going to look at all of the neighborhoods and find out which neighborhoods contain this point. And sure enough, we get a result, and it's essentially an area in Harlem, central Harlem, North Polo Grounds. And so again, this is a set of polygons, <clears throat> and it just returns literally that geometry, that polygon. So now we know the location of that. We don't know. We know that's a point, but now we know that point is within the area of central North Ireland. So if this was a restaurant, we'd know where it was. But more importantly, if this was me, I now know I'm somewhere near central Harlem North Polo Grounds. <clears throat> so now I want to find all restaurants within sort of one-third of a kilometer of me. 
right? That's easy to do now. I can do db.restaurants.find, and I give my location, and I'm going to ask the restaurants, geo within, find me restaurants within, and the center sphere is essentially a circle, right? And that circle is going to be five kilometers. I should edit that. That should have been 3.5. And because distances in geo are measured in radians, to turn it into kilometers, we're going to divide it by the radius of the Earth, 6,378 kilometers here. <clears throat> that will give us the distance that we now need to look for from this point. So essentially what we're saying is within this point, here's a point. I'm going to put a circle around this point, And anything within that circle that's a restaurant, I'm going to return it. And so what we get is a long list of restaurants. I projected the restaurants to remove object ID and location, so it just gives us a rest list of restaurant mm -hmm. names. If you didn't project mm -hmm. it, what you'd get is um, you get the full document, which is essentially got an ID and the coordinates and the name there. So what you have here is a database feature that allows you to index documents to find areas or points that overlap within, within an area or adjacent to it, geo within that finds areas on a point that lie within a specific area, and then geo near, which returns locations in order from nearest to furthest. So geo near gives you a sorted order. <clears throat> now there's a range of other operations, but the point is you can get started playing with the geospatial operators from scratch with that data set and get a very quick understanding of how to use these things in a real world example. And I encourage you to try those locations on Google Maps because it makes it real. I can also show you something that we've just launched at MongoDB World last week. Let me show you the Compass application. So if I just open up MongoDB Compass here, MongoDB, is, MongoDB Compass is a GUI application that effectively allows you to look at all of your data in a graphical format, in a graphical way. So here I have my geo database, and here's my neighborhood collection, and here's my restaurant. And notice it says I've got an ID index here, and I've got a location 2D sphere index, which is geospatial as opposed to regular. <clears throat> and it will take you to the documentation if you click there. So one thing else I can do is if I go to the schema and I go to the restaurant's location, something I can do is I can zoom in here. And as I get to New York, it will show me all the locations of those restaurants. So I can start to see all the points defined. And this is something we introduced just this week in Compass 3.2. So now what you can do is you can look at your geospatial data and actually get a sense of it. So what we can see here is this is all the restaurants in the New York metropolitan area. This is something you couldn't do until quite recently. But you can see on the left-hand side I've got my geo database. I've got local. I've got a test database here. I've got a VOSA database, which is actually a, a car database from the U.K., and so you get a graphical view of all of your data, and you can look at the documents and get a sense of them there as well. So if I go to the restaurants collection, just go to the geo database, we can see uh, that's the old documents there. And you can look at the explain plans and the indexes that are installed there. So I do encourage you to use Compass and download it and have a play around with it as a as part of your exercising of the uh, environment. So what have we learned today? There are two important different kind of indexes that we support in MongoDB. Text indexes that allow full text searching and geospatial indexes that allow searching by location, by, by intersection, <coughs> or by distance from a point. Text indexes become very important when we're starting to grab something like the text stream from Twitter or all the data on a blog or all the data on our website and trying to do, make meaning of it. 
Geospatial indexes become important when we're building mobile applications because location is something a mobile application offers you for free. Being able to search based on that context becomes very important. That's all from the webinar today. Um, I'm going to try and cover off some of the questions now. Um, and let me have a quick look at what's been posted here. Um, Venkata asks, what's the difference between Ensure Index and Create Index? Um, create Index is the default way. Ensure Index is an old dep deprecated function. We probably won't support that in the future. So if you're using anything, use Create Index. Uh, Jayesh asks, do we have any clue tring index in MongoDB? I don't know what a clue tring index is, Jayesh. Do drop an email on Back to Basics. Venkata uh, uh, asks, is data also stored in B3 format in WireTiger? Yes, it is, but they do lots of clever things with the B3s to ensure that they're efficiently updated. Uh, does indexing have an impact on sharding? Yes, you want to index on your shard key, and the shard key being indexed effectively means that you can very efficiently search the sharding. But you can build indexes on any key in a sharded cluster. Uh, Sanchet says, the index build can be seen in the log. Does MongoDB also maintain the log for searches and queries that are issued in the database and the indexes that are getting used? We, we will show index builds. We will so show searches and queries that run for longer than 100 milliseconds by default. Otherwise, we don't trap all of those. You can set the timing, uh, the slow queries uh, value to one millisecond. And that will capture pretty much all the queries you want to capture. Victorio asks, is Compass a free application? Um, uh, it's not free. It's part of the MongoDB Enterprise Package, but you can definitely download it and use it for free when you're evaluating and developing your application. Once you move that into production, you must start paying for Compass and the other components. Um, how do we support other reporting tools to connect to MongoDB and get reports or dashboards out of it? Uh, Anand, we can use the BI Connector. We haven't covered that on this course, but if you type BI Connector, into the MongoDB website, it will give you full documentation. <clears throat> the BI connector is non-free. John Cantwell, what is the recommended GUI for MongoDB? Well, we recommend Compass. We think that's the best GUI. But if you just want to look at the data rather than the overall structure of how MongoDB manages it, then I would look at a BI connector and look at one of the BI tools. Tableau is pretty good. Bill Reynolds says, with a distance from a point, you use the value for the radius of the Earth. This changes from point to point, so to be accurate, do you need to calculate this value based on the location being used, or is a constant good enough? Phil, that depends on how accurate you need to be. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of rounding in, in GPS coordinates in general. They're not expected to be accurate for more than about 100 meters. Um, there are ways and means to make that more accurate. I'm not going to go into it in terms of this uh, webinar series. Uh, JS, I meant clustering index. Do you have any clustering index? Uh, sorry, Jess. No, we don't have clustered indexes. Richard Franco, could you please indicate some examples of geospatial index applied to Internet of Things or mobile communications? Well, Internet of Things, Richard, well, imagine you wanted to track the location of all of the cars in a taxi service or all of the buses that are a public communication service then you'd want to be able to have real-time updates from those services of what their location was mapped to a map so that you could track where they were. We see this with Halo and with Uber, where they can tell you where their cabs are online. For mobile communications, understanding the locations of the towers and the relative location of people who are sending to the towers becomes important because you want to know where the vast majority of your users are in order to place new towers. Uh, Ravish says, what is, when is it right to create an index, and when is it better to use non-index data? Um, Ravish, if you're doing table scans all the time, if, you, if you're doing select star from effectively, an index isn't going to help. So if you're pulling all the data out, then you're probably more efficient just to let it do a table scan. <coughs> Sheriffo Cisse. Hi, Sheriffo. 
what, what are some of the limitations of index in relation to index size? Um, there are some limitations, not in terms of index size, um, but I need to look them up. I mean, there's a limit on how many indexes you can have in a collection, but it's in the hundreds. Um, but the only real size to the size of your index itself is the size of the, your disk and the size of your collection. Uh, Swapnil says, during a MongoDB DB restore, is there no way to postpone build index so that MongoDB restore finishes quickly? When you're doing a restore, what I suggest you do is build the index in the background. When you do a background build of an index, we didn't talk about this today, you can specify a dollar background argument, and that, that will effectively build the index in the background, and it won't interrupt uh, existing MongoDB operations. Uh, Sarah Vannan says, using dollar lookup, try to join two collections, that time index used. Dollar lookup is used if, it's if an index is available. Uh, Venkata, our index is also stored in document format. Um, no, indexes are stored internally in a format that the B tree uses. So we, we, you can you, you manipulate them with JSON, but they're stored internally in a binary format, not JSON. Okay, I think that's all the questions today. So, uh, okay, Andrew Finch just threw, threw one in. Is the text search an explicit wildcard search? I, if you search on info, will it find information? <clears throat> it will find info. It won't find information because information isn't a stem of info. Um, so we are working on extending the search capabilities, but I don't think it will find information. Uh, but it would find inform and informed, I think, if you search for inform, because informed is a valid, uh, inform is a stem of informed. Uh, text index versus regex, can you comment? Um, text indexes will search for words. Regular expressions, <clears throat> if they're not constructed correctly, can often force a table scan on the database. Um, we can only really search regular expressions that are rooted at the front efficiently. Um, if you're rooting from the back, we end up doing table scans. That's not the case for text indexes, Sharifo. Uh, Swapnil says, will the size of the op-log file affect the index and performance of MongoDB? No, it's not relevant. These are two different things. The op-log is how we replicate. The indexing is, uh, it, it happens as we insert. So <clears throat> effectively, when you do an insert on the primary, that insert on the primary is replicated in the secondaries via the op-log. So the cost of creation on the primary is identical on the secondaries. So it doesn't particularly affect it. Okay, folks, I'm going to wrap it up for today. Do join us for the next webinar series, which will be on the MongoDB aggregation framework, uh, a, a, a little known but incredibly valuable addition to the tool set that allows you to do group by and reshape your data effectively. Uh, that will be in a couple of weeks' time. Look out for the email. Uh, talk to you soon. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you on the next webinar.